Good morning, church. Good morning. This is a day the Lord has made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Men's breakfast next Saturday morning, 7 a.m. here at the church. I uh, want to welcome all of you who are here today, some new faces. You're welcome, and we're glad you're here. If you have any questions, contact somebody other than me after church. <laughs> no. If you have questions, be free to ask those and uh, talk to myself, Ruth, uh, any of the leadership here, and we'll get those questions answered. But no, good to see you here today. Uh, winter is here. We've had fall. Now we're into winter. It always does this to us, right? But have you looked at the forecast this week? It's supposed to be in the 50s, so we're still going to be happy for that. Any prayer concerns this morning as we begin to worship? We're all prayed up. All right. I want to welcome those of you who are watching online with us yet once again through Facebook or through YouTube, wherever it is. It's an absolute joy to use the means of media that we have today. So I want to thank you for being part of our worship today. We're going to open with prayer. We're going to sing a couple songs. Praise God. We're going to come around the word, have a good time of worship. I'm teaching on the Holy Spirit today. It's a topic that I love to teach on. It's a very broad topic, but we're going to touch on maybe one little element of the Holy Spirit today. So let's pray. Father, we praise you for who you are. Your word tells us that praise is to make a joyful noise. And then when we settle into worship, your word tells us that worship is to be calm and to be in your presence where you speak to us. So Father, give us the unique opportunity today to experience both praise and worship. I thank you for every person here. You, you have gathered this fellowship today physically and online for a very specific reason. And we do ask that through the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit, we're touched, we're moved, and we're enlightened through the presence of your word and through the purpose and power of the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray for everybody that we know all who are watching who have been infected with COVID. We pray for everybody who has experienced the flu, strep throat, fall allergies, headaches. Father, will you tell us to come to you and bring everything to you? So we're coming to you right now. We're asking for that healing hand on the marriage that's suffering the wayward child, the person who's struggling with an addiction. We're asking that the blood of Jesus, we know that has the power to heal, to change, to protect all of us. We thank you for what you've already done. Father, we pray a continued protection as we enter into a fall season where there's a new virus, but there's still the flu, there's still everything else. Protect us and heal us spiritually, physically, and mentally. Bless our worship today. Let the Spirit have his freedom so that we leave here today knowing full well, hallelujah, we sat in the presence of a living God. In your name we pray, amen. Let's stand. Yeah.
shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see Worship His 
sing this next song. I'm just going to ask that everybody just just make it the two of you, meaning you and, and Christ. Because he's saying, come just as you are, no matter what's happened in the past, no matter what happened this week. He's saying, come just as you are. So as we get ready to hear an amazing message, let's spend some time with just him, preparing our hearts for what he has for us this morning.
just as you are. Hear the Spirit call. Come just as you Next Sunday, November 22nd, we're going to label that as our uh, Thanksgiving service. Give thanks. It's a, it's a standalone sermon, but right after that, we're going to decorate the fellowship hall, and if you're willing to be part of that, then you're going to get to be part of a potluck meal that follows the decorating. So I encourage everybody to be part of that. Even if you don't want to decorate, it's a good time of fellowship. That's next Sunday. Today's a standalone message. He said what? He referring to who would be the Holy Spirit. So if you have your Bible with you today, and if you believe like I do, this is the infallible children's church can be dismissed at this time. I always forget that. Somebody's got to put a big sign back there. You can go either way. You can go right out there. Absolutely fine. All right. All right. We believe this Bible, you can repeat after me, we believe the Bible, we believe the Bible. To, be the to be the infallible, inspired, inspired Word, of God. Word of God. Amen. Amen. Infallible simply means it's without error. It, it is God's Word and it is without error. Inspired means that it is given the insight, penned through man, but it is wrote by the finger of God. Now, God chose something very unique. He didn't just hand us scrolls that he pre-put together. No, he gave his wisdom, his knowledge, spiritual knowledge through man, and man penned it. It is inspired. People get hung up on this. Well, just average man wrote the Bible. He did work through man, but it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And there's a lot of scriptures to support that. It's the infallible, inspired Word of God. And if you believe that, don't let anybody sideways you on that one. That's all you got to say. It, it's without error, written by the Holy Spirit. I believe it to be the truth. And we're going to look at this truth today. He said what? Rarely do we have enough information on the Holy Spirit. There's the Father, there's the Son, and there's the Holy Spirit. We say it all the time. We say it in the Apostles' Creed. We say it in the Lord's Prayer. I, I bless you when I do the benediction, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you know him? Yeah. Do you know him? And that's the purpose of one message here today, to learn who the Holy Spirit is. He is the most important person on earth today. It's not the president. It's not your library. It's not the Library of Congress. It's not the Masonian Institute where all these things are gathered together. The most imper important person walking, existing, living within people today is the Holy Spirit of God. Now just think about that for a minute. It is God's Spirit that is here. In the beginning, God created and the Spirit hovered and created. Throughout the whole Old Testament, the Holy Spirit settled upon men and they prophesied towards Jesus. The whole Old Testament, the Spirit prophesied to Jesus coming. The Spirit of the Lord came upon them and they pointed forward. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Mary and she was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit came upon Jesus when he came out of the water when he was baptized and he was sealed by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness where he was tempted to make sure that he was ready for the position that he was called into the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit was with Jesus when he died. He said the last words. He took his breath and he said, I give up my spirit into thy hands. I commit my spirit. The Holy Spirit was there. Romans chapter 1 verse 4. The Holy Spirit was there during resurrection. He rose Christ back to life. You're beginning to see the, the presence of the Holy Spirit as all throughout Scripture. Years ago, I had a guy call me leading a Bible study. He said, can you, can you uh, answer a question for us tonight? Because half of our group says that the Holy Spirit was not in the Old Testament. And the other half of the group says that he was. I was like, wow, okay then. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is evidence throughout all of Scripture. He's there in the beginning. He's all the way through the whole Old Testament. He is continuously working in your life and my life. He's in charge of the earth. You need to know him. And what I've experienced in the Christian walk today, there's more people that do not know the power and the purpose of the Holy Spirit than do know. In the Christian realm. And I'm like, you're missing the whole thing. The whole thing. John 14, 15 through 17, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And people always say, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus fulfilled all the law. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus commanded 63 different commands. That's just one of them. He said, that's the greatest. But when he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandment, what he's talking about here, you will confess to know me. If you truly love me, understand me, who I am, you will confess to know me. That's one of his commands, that you know me. So if you love me, you will know me, you'll keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you only on Sunday mornings. No, no forever. Forever. He'll be with you forever. Forever. He's called the spirit of truth, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Every, have you ever talked to somebody who is what I call spiritually discerned? They do not have the Holy Spirit, and conversation with this individual is very tough. And here's the reason. Because it neither sees him nor knows him. If you're not saved, you don't have the spirit, and you're trying to talk spiritual things with them, they don't have a clue. They're, they're not with you because they have never seen him, they've never experienced him, and they don't know him. Know here is the word that I've taught you. You know when you know her that you know. They don't know. <laughs> Simply put, you know him. Talking to the disciples. You know him. For he dwells with you and will be in your neighbor's house. He'll be in you. Now just think about this for a minute. The disciples, the called 12, are walking with Christ. They watch him lay hands on a blind guy and he sees. They watch him touch a person's ears and he hears. They watch him drive out demons. They're with him and they're around him and they're experiencing on this. Seth, you want to stand up? And, and they're, they're part of this ministry that is like crazy. Just stand in front of me here. So they're with Jesus. People got to see your face. <laughs> So they're with Jesus, and they're, they're doing ministry together with him, and it's so cool. Oh, my gosh. We're watching him do all this stuff, but then Jesus starts to talk about leaving. It bothered them. It, it, it actually really bothered them to the core. What are we going to do with you? You leave, Jesus. But then he says this. It's okay that I go because I have to go so that the one will come. And when the one comes and when you confess to believe, you're no longer going to know about me. I'm going to be in you. You feel that? <laughs> in you. People never really comprehend this. I'm not out here. This has been a good time. But I'm in you. Thank you. He's in you. The Spirit of God in you. Paul says in the book of Corinthians, he says that he thinks so much of you, he takes up residency in you, and you become his temple. Now, if you have a person in you, don't you want to talk to them? Don't, don't you want to get to know what they're thinking, what they're saying, what they want you to do? He no longer dwells with you, but he will be in you. John 16, 
4 through 15. I've said these things to you that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. There it is. We were hanging out. But now I'm going to him, Father, who sent me, and none of you ask, where are you going? Just, just be a disciple sitting at Jesus' feet. I'm leaving, and none of them ask, where are you going, Jesus? All they could think about is he's going to be gone, and we're going to miss out. Because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Verse 7, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, counselor, spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Love that language. And when he comes, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Jesus knows exactly what we need. He gives us verse 8, then verse 8 and 9, and 10 unpacks it. He will convict the world concerning sin. Now, I just want to really go stop here for a minute. You're having a really bad day. You were an alcoholic for 25 years. You've been clean for 10. And the bad day comes, and the enemy says, Do you know what the best remedy for your bad day is? Go get drunk. Now, people have a tendency to say that the Holy Spirit convicts you or condemns you on your sin. Now, listen to me very carefully. You put this verse into the context into which Jesus is speaking it. He will convict the world concerning sin. How many times will you be convicted on your sin? Sin here is a noun. My English teachers, nouns are person, place, and thing. So it's a person. He's convicting you on your old person, unregenerated, separated from God. Non-believer. So the Holy Spirit settles upon you and convicts you in your non-believing state. And he says, you need to know Jesus. That's convicting you of the old Adam's sin. How many times has that happened to you? One time. You only need to be born again once. Right? How many times do you need to be born again? And people take this verse out of context and they'll say that the Holy Spirit is convicting me of sin. you got to get this right between your ears. He convicts you of the old Adam's sin, born-again spirit, one time. Don't go thinking you got to be born again on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday. You get saved once. And everybody said? So... He'll convict you, but the sin of the old Adam you get convicted on one time. Oh, hallelujah, I need you, Jesus. Get behind me saying, I don't need to drink anymore. I'm a born-again believer. You're convicted on that sin one time. Now you're saved. Now, will he bring to your attention your actions, your verb, actions? Yes. But listen to me very carefully here, too. The Holy Spirit does not condemn If you're hearing the words, you're no good. You've made a mistake. You've been abused. You're a broken product. If you're hearing that language, that is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts you on your righteousness. World concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Concerning sin because they didn't believe me. There it is. They didn't believe me, so I get convicted on my unrighteousness. One time I become righteous concerning righteousness because I go to the Father. People mix this up so bad, and it drives me crazy. Well, the Holy Spirit's condemned. No, the Holy, the Holy Spirit may convict you, but he doesn't condemn you. He convicts you on your righteousness. So the guy who had the alcohol problem clean for 10 years and he's being convicted, this is what the Holy Spirit says. Do you really 
remember who you are? I'm a child of God. I'm a born-again believer. You are his righteousness. And when you hear that, you're wearing the robe of righteousness. You're a son of the king. You're a daughter of the king. And when you hear the conviction on righteousness, you say, praise God. I am clean. I do wear the robe. I don't have to be doing A, B, C, or D. What do you tell the woman who was caught in adultery? Who, who here condemns you? Nobody. And I told the ones who were without sin to throw the first stone. They all left. Jesus says, so who condemns you? Nobody. And then Jesus said this, the one who was there that could condemn her, who was without sin? Jesus. The one who could condemn her did not condemn her. And what did he tell her? Go and sin no more. So when you're convicted on your righteousness, that's what you hear. Hallelujah, I got the robe of righteousness. The blood of Jesus has redeemed me. Don't, you don't have to be born again. You just claim who you are. And he says, go, child, and sin no more. You get to sin no more. You get to live under the blood of Jesus Christ. He'll convict you of your sin one time, then after that he convicts you on your righteousness. The judgment is on the devil. Because the world... Because the ruler of this world is judged. That's concerning, that's concerning the dark. So as you remember, the Holy Spirit's going to bring you into the presence of God. He's going to convict you on your righteousness. He's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, the fruits of the Spirit. And he wants you to live a life of freedom, not bondage. It's the Holy Spirit's job to bring you into his presence. I always tell people, just like we did with Seth, that he's no longer around you. You can talk about God all day, but until you realize that God's on the inside, you're not saved. And once you realize that, if this little cup of water is the Holy Spirit, just just think of it this way. I, I can talk about this all day. I can make God look good. Man, he's good. I believe in his word. I believe in his son. But if you're not saved, it's not in here. You know how many people live in this economy? Oh, God's awesome. God's so cool. And they go over here and live a life like hell. And they come into church and they worship on one hour a week and they think, oh, God's great. But they have never received his spirit. The only way you're going to receive his spirit is if you confess to know him. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And when I confess to know him, where does the spirit go? Ah. Just been enlightened, just been regenerated. Now I can see and I can know and I can understand. So when you're in trouble, who do you go to? CNN. Who do you go to? You see, we, we don't get in the habit to go to your knees and go to God and say, Spirit, enlighten me. Anybody ever said something bad? Why don't you check in with the Holy Spirit before you speak? Why don't before we say something, right now we're living in an economy that's divisive. We're, we're being split. You drive a Buick, I drive a Ford. It, it's, it's simple things, but it's the enemy using the economy of where we're at right now in society to split us apart. So before you speak, before you act, before you do, stop. The Holy Spirit is in me. Tell me what to say. So what if you don't talk for two, three minutes? Do you know we as humans don't like silence? You ever been in a conversation? And, or if I were to stop talking right now, six to ten seconds makes people uncomfortable. And if it goes beyond that, they get really squirmish. He's stroking out. Something happened to him. Or what's going on with the pastor? We don't like silence. Yet God says, be still and know that I am God. Just be still before you speak. Be still before you gossip. Be still before you talk bad about. And let the Spirit speak to you. I was just enlightened this last week from a young man that said he was putting his shoes on one morning. And he didn't fully understand. But he was learning and the Holy Spirit said, just sit down. You got a couple minutes. 
puts his shoes on, puts his coat on, heading out the door, just stop. You got a couple minutes. Didn't know for sure what it was. Two minutes later, he was in a very serious car accident, got rear-ended by a semi. The Holy Spirit speaks. The Holy Spirit knows. Learning to listen to the Spirit. Spirit. Teenagers, where are my teenagers today? When you're in a relationship and you're going to date the opposite sex, and you're wondering where this relationship is to go, should it go, shouldn't it go, what should I do, stop. Holy Spirit, enlighten me. Should I be with this person? Should I marry this person? Should I date this person? Guess what? God reveals that to you. But people don't know that the Spirit speaks. What is the number one, the most powerful way for us to understand this? Acts 2, 17 and 18. I'm going to encourage you to do something today because when you start to do this, you're going to be enlightened. In the last days it shall be. In the Old Testament, it was the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord when the prophets spoke. This is Joel. In the last days, Peter is quoting him. In the last days, so Joel is not speaking about in his economy, he's speaking in Jesus' economy. Jesus was the last days. God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. What? Read that. God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Every person walking on planet earth has opportunity to know him. Every person has the opportunity, Romans 10, 19, faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word. When your presence in the word, you have an opportunity to know him because he's pouring his spirit on all people. And there's a lot of people who say no. That's not the spirit of truth. But I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. How many of you here today are a son or daughter? We all are. So there's nobody missed here. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And we're going to learn what that word says. And your young men shall, shall see visions. Anybody under 55 here? Raise your hand, men. Men. Men under 55. Put them up. We're, we're such a shy bunch. All right. You guys are seeing visions. That's what the word says. The young men, I don't know what the cutoff is for young men. I'd like to think I'm still in that category. <laughs> I, I don't know what, what is old and what's young. All right, 70 and under. We're, we're going to see visions. <laughs> we'll take that. Young men shall see visions. Old men shall dream dreams even on my male servant, female servant. And in these days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. The word see, see visions. And just, just hang on. The word see here means to behold, to behold, you're seeing it, but to attain it and to, to realize it, that what you have visualized will materialize in this season. Remember I told you the smallest words in Scripture have the most impact? Let me read that again. To see with an understanding, not to behold it, but to realize, to attain it, that what you have visualized will materialize in this season. So in other words, you're moving from spiritual into material. And he gives us this. So what's he talking about? We're going to move from visual into material. We're going to move from spiritual into material. A non-believer looks at a math equation on a piece of paper, and he sees a whole bunch of numbers visualizing, but he can't attain it. A believer sees all the numbers on the piece of paper, but knows the answer. To see with an understanding... 
So if we can see with an understanding, and we're all going to prophesy. See, people miss the prophetic word here. What does prophesy mean? Revelations 19.10. To prophesy... Revelation 19.10. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers and who behold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. I'm trying to help you today to learn that the Holy Spirit is in you, and I want you to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit. Here's your number one rule to learn how to listen to the Holy Spirit is if you prophesy to the testimony of the whole of Jesus. So what does that mean? If you're a born again believer, you need to be speaking out who he is. Oh, but we hired Pastor Lynn. We pay him a salary to do that. According to Scripture, what Joel said in Acts and what Joel says in Joel and what Revelation says about this word prophetic prophecy that's a testimony of Jesus to the spirit of prophecy. We are all called, remember the Spirit's going to fall on the sons and daughters and everybody, we are all called to confess Jesus Christ is Lord. His blood saved me. I've been redeemed. When's the last time you told somebody that? Hallelujah. I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. You guys are all sideways. No, don't tell them that. <laughs> this is what the prophetic means, that you will prophesy to the testimony of Christ. It isn't that you're going to give some insight, that you're going to know what's going to happen in the next election, or even this one. That's not what the word means here. The word means that if you're saved, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you will testify to the testimony of Jesus. I love that. Do you realize how, how much of an impact we're going to make in this community because we're prophesying to the testimony of Christ? I said two weeks ago that this town is going to miss this church if for whatever reason it doesn't exist here because a church, ecclesia, called out group of people is to serve the community. Not the community to serve us. Hence the reason I personally have a problem with fundraisers. Because we're here to give to the community. We're not asking the community to come here and give to us because we're going to prophesy to the testimony of Christ. We're going to give this town what it means to believe in Jesus. There's your number one. So if you've never if you've never told somebody about the power of the blood of Jesus, the first lesson today is when you want to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit, start to speak that out. Say it to somebody. And I, I don't mean be rude, you know, you better believe in Jesus, get on your knees and confess your sins. No, you, you live it. You, 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 you just, it's who you are. Your love. In a time of divisiveness and, and separation, let's, let's bring the love of Christ into the conversation and people can see it. Now here's the other tension. I get talking about the Holy Spirit. We'll be here till 6 o'clock. But here's the other tension. Okay, number one, you're going to speak to the salvation of Jesus. You're called to prophesy. Everybody. Young guys, you're going to have visions. Old guys, you're going to have dreams. We're going to use them to preach the word. But here's the other problem. Churches from about, I'm studying it right now, late 20s and 30s, 1920 and 30. There was a period where these churches were on fire. They were filled with the Spirit. There were revivals. Everything was moving good. And then all of a sudden, about in the last 60, 70 years, we moved into a period where the Holy Spirit was silenced. Jesus lost his position in the church, and they silenced the Spirit. And they stepped up and said, listen, if you want to come to church... You need to do this, this, and this, and this, and on Friday, do this. They began to put rules and regulations. Some of you feel guilty and con condemned because the church has imposed upon you rules and regulations made by man, not God. 
And when that happens, you come to church out of guilt. You come to church under the old covenant. You come to church thinking, I'm condemned, I'm worthless, I'm no good, I'm broken, I'm dirty, and you feel worthless. And the church has made us to feel this way. Research in the last... 1977, psychological research, churches are causing people to be schizophrenic. Churches are causing people and are creating psychosis. Psychosis is psychotic behavior. Churches are causing people schizophrenic psychosis because they're pressuring people to live by a code of ethics that they stand on is directly from the word of God and it's making them feel guilty. That hurts. But can you see it? There's churches that would take, uh, uh, they would have a meeting on whether or not you can be a member. And this is where this psychosis is coming from. So actually what this report, which is 40 years old, is saying the church has done more damage to Christianity than good. So the tension here of taking away the Holy Spirit and not listening to the Holy Spirit has caused us to crater. And I'm here today to tell you that the Holy Spirit is freedom. The Holy Spirit is life. The Holy Spirit leads you into all truth. And if somebody comes up to you and says, you're no good, you got to do this, you better get on your knees, they're living, and here's what happens. We mess old, mess old covenant with new covenant. They're living under the stone. Moses went up the mountain, got the stone. They lived by it. They had a sacrificial system. But guess what? Jesus was the final sacrifice. Jesus completed that. When he died on the cross, the curtain was torn. You have direct access to the Father. You get in trouble. You find your way to the foot of this cross. You lay up here and confess your sin to Jesus. Bam, you're going to know that he loves you. He cares for you. He's not the one condemning you. And if somebody says to you, I don't like what you're doing, say, hey, you know what? Take it up with my dad. He's the Father, he's God Almighty, and Jesus is still sitting at the right hand of the throne, and he loves me. Don't let people destroy this for you. The next time somebody brings up your past, says, talk to my dad. I'm wearing the robe of righteousness. I am filled with the Holy Spirit. I have made a mistake. He tells me to go and sin no more. You see, we've got to get used to this. It's an unlearning. It's a new teaching. The Holy Spirit teaches you from the inside out. And you know what I've experienced? This is just sidebar for your benefit. People have a tendency to blame me. They would rather come and say bad things to me about what I'm doing and about how I'm presenting the gospel and what I'm doing wrong instead of looking at themselves. And I had to learn this in a hard way in a hospital bed. Not me in a hospital bed, in a visitation. I was doing my internship for chaplaincy. It was a 10-week stint living in the hospital. And my first weekend, and my mentor was a guy, no kidding, he was this tall, Father Dale. He, he was a little Irishman, cool guy. Nothing stopped Father Dale. He's my mentor. I go down the hall. I go in this room, and there's seven and a half foot Native American laying in the bed. His feet hung that far over the end of the bed. This guy was huge. I re, you know, you remember things like that. So I said, I'm the head chaplain here, and they told me that you would like a visit, and he says, get the hell out. Well, I'm new at this. I'm like, anything else I can help you with? <laughs> you know, <laughs> there's the door. So I leave. So I go down the hall. I know I'm in trouble. So here's Father Dale. I said, Father Dale, can you come and help me? I said, I got a problem with this guy. He says, this is the first guy you've seen today. I said, I know. <laughs> so takes me by the hand, Father Dale. We go up next to the bed and we stand there. And this is what I learned. It's not us personally. It's who we represent. So Father Dale says, I heard you told some harsh words to my, my young chaplain here. He says, what's your problem? And he looked right at us. And he says, listen, you guys, I went to a Catholic school and they beat the S out of me. There's a door. 
Father Dale looks at him, didn't even miss a beat. He goes, well, obviously, they didn't beat it all out of you. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And the guy starts crying. But he broke down that barrier because we had, I had to learn it's not them, it's who we represent. People are mad at God because they've never understood the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to reveal the truth to them, and all of a sudden, God gets the blame. That's a real angst I have. Why did God condemn? Why did God do that? God didn't do that. We live in a broken, fallen world, but God makes good out of all things. Give God the glory. Let the enemy have the condemnation. God forgave. God restores. The old man is dead. I'm complete. I'm done. I'm brand new. Hallelujah. I got a coat of polish on me like none other. It's called the robe of righteousness. And the Holy Spirit leads me into that. I'm complete. I'm valuable. I have worth. I'm not a mistake. And everybody said, he has a purpose for you. Listen to the Holy Spirit. And I leave you with this. Jesus ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? You do. Do you believe as a confessing believer, you have the presence of the Spirit in you? Yes. So I want you to hear something loud and clear as I, I, I leave you with this today. You can never blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You can never speak bad against him. Why? He's in you. He's who you have become. It's who you are. You cannot speak bad of yourself. I mean, how crazy would it be for you to look in the mirror and say, look at the Holy Spirit in me. He's ugly, he's worthless, and he's bad. It doesn't happen. I want you to hear this loud and clear because I ran into this just a few years ago. I had a believer come to me and say, can I blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? I said, no, you can't. And Jesus makes that very clear in Luke chapter 11. They're accusing him of doing miracles in the name of the devil. And he said, why would Beelzebub do things according to, against himself? However, if you give the devil credit for what the Holy Spirit is doing, that's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, and it's an unpardonable sin, and you will never see heaven. There's three times that shows up in Scripture, and Jesus says, if you do that, you're not talking bad about the Father, you're not talking bad about Jesus, but you start talking bad about the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, you better be careful. Only a non-believer can do that. Not a believer. Because you're, you're filled with the Spirit. But a non-believer, he says, if you speak... Here, here's what it is, though. If you give the devil credit for what he is doing, it's over. Ananias and Sapphira, they brought the money into the new church. Here's the money from the farm. Peter's filled with the Spirit. We know they lied, they died. Wife comes in. Is this the truth? Look at the door. There's the feet of the man who's going to carry you out if you don't speak the truth. She lied. She died. You don't speak bad about the Holy Spirit. But here's the beautiful part of it. You're a confessing believer. You never will. You don't have to worry about that. If you're a non-believer... It's serious business. But you are filled with the Holy Spirit. You have the dwelling, the in-presence, the favor of God upon you. You'll never do that. You'll never do that. So I encourage people, you're going you're to make your prophetic statement. You're going out into the world. You're going to talk about Jesus. Talk about Jesus. Because there's so many people that need him. Tell them that, you know what, I belong to a grace fellowship. There's no condemnation. That curtain's been torn. You can call the pastor and talk to him if you want to, but just talk to God and follow yourself. Tell him the truth of what you have. Tell, tell him that, gosh, this, this spirit life is crazy. That's what God wants you to prophesy about. 
How great is our God? How great is your salvation? And Jesus promised that those who confess to believe, I freely give him. When you get home today, instead of saying your normal prayer before your meal, some of you never pray before your meal, that's okay. I'm not condemning you. Do you know why we ever started praying over food anyway during the bubonic plague? I can never say that word, 13th century. There was so much poison, there was so much ill in, in the world that the food most time that they ate was poison. But they were so hungry, they were starving, they, they didn't have anything else, so they started to pray over their meals. Come Lord Jesus, protect us when we eat. I, I don't know why, where was I going? When you pray, ask for the Holy Spirit to reveal to you the wisdom of God. Ask him for that. Scripture tells us that he freely gives the wisdom and he wants to give it abundantly. So start to pray in the Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, fill me with your wisdom today. I got a house full of kids. Man, they're driving me crazy. I got teenagers that are starting to date. Help me. Fill me with your wisdom. I, I'm at a crossroads in my employment. You got a job for me? Ask him for that wisdom. Learn to listen to the Spirit and live the Spirit-filled life. I don't know about you, but that's when your hair stands up. That's when it gets really exciting. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Father, there's people sitting here today, people listening to this today, that know you're real. You, they know your word. They, they know that you're, you're the electricity. You're the power source. But maybe they've never plugged anything in. So I pray that those who are listening, those who are sitting here today, can just settle into your presence knowing full well that you're in them, you're with them, you're protecting them, and you're going to fill them with your wisdom for them to prophesy to the greatest message known to mankind. Father, flood this community with the good news. And you promise that what we ask in your name, thy will be done. We're asking for a move of the Holy Spirit like we've never seen before. We're asking for a rivers of living water to flow through the streets, flow through the homes, and where those damages have been done, where the condemnation has been done, where the abortion has happened, and where the meth house has happened. Father, we're praying that the blood of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit sweep through this town and cleanse it. We're your only avenue. Unless we move, nothing happens. So I'm asking for that fullness and the outpouring for us to be the hands and feet of Christ. And if you're listening to this today, the Holy Spirit will meet you right there on the couch, right there at the kitchen table, wherever you're sitting right now and having that cup of coffee. And I pray that the Holy Spirit comes into every one of those homes every one of those marriages, every one of those families. And those who are open to receive, receive that fullness. We're excited, Father. We're excited, Jesus, what you're doing through your spirit. We are excited to see the visions, to have the dreams, and to prophesy to our Jesus. Bless this group today, Father, as they go, knowing full well they have been touched in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, the name that's above all names. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. Let's make this our prayer today. Lord, let your light.
We just thank you for meeting us here today. We thank you for the message that you have given all of us, Lord. Father, we may take that message and we may we put it in our hearts. May we live that message. May we learn from that message, Lord. As we go, may the Lord keep you and bless you and be with you forever. In his name we pray. Amen.